1986, a year where some of the biggest hit songs of 1986 were also from some of the biggest hit movies of that same year. And in video games, we were starting to see the birth of some of the most important, some of the most long-standing, and some of the most amazing video games ever made in history. Let's check out the year 1986. Every year we make it through, more and more memories are locked into place in our minds. Certain video games or movies or even a simple chorus from a song you knew and loved can mean so much. Let's take a moment and talk about what makes each year from our past so special. On today's episode, the year is... To start off with movies, we're going to start with one of the greatest trios in the history of film, and that is The Three Amigos. To do a personal appearance with this guy, El Guapo, who is probably the biggest actor to ever come out of Mexico. Wow, the infamous? This movie is probably my most dad's quoted movie of all time. I don't think we've ever gone through a Christmas without him opening up a box and him saying, it's a sweater. This movie has one of my favorite storylines of all time. It is three Hollywood actors, three movie stars, so to say, and they think they're going out to a town to put on a show, to do a performance of some sort, but in reality, they're actually going to a town that actually needs help. These are three people that became some of my favorite actors of all time, and that is definitely due to this movie. You know, Chevy Chase, Steve Martin, Martin Short. Also, the song, you know pretty soon, that big yellow moon will light the way home to the one you love. That song is actually really important to my family because that's a song that my dad would sing to all my kids when he'd be babysitting and putting them down when they were very small. And now to this day, that is transferred over to me and that is my responsibility now, my kids all the time, uh, amongst a few other songs that we sing from the Beatles and whatnot. This song is definitely one of them. And with my kids obviously playing the important part of the horses. Boom, 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 boom. Good night, Ned. Good night, Ned. A movie that I've talked about numerous times on the show, and that is Labyrinth, a fantastic spectacle of visual performance, great music as well. This is, as I've stated before, where the dark tones, I've talked about movies like Return to Oz, like Willow, like Dark Crystal, all these movies have kind of molded into one certain type of film. And I feel like those four movies for me kind of have like the same feel where there's even times where I kind of mix up which movie was which. But I love the visuals, I love the music. You know, you have dance, magic, dance. If you have kids and you want to show them this movie, make sure they're not spooked out by kind of even weird imagery because there is some weird stuff in here, some definitely darker elements in the movie that might not necessarily scare your kids, but I could see it being the kind of movie where when they go to bed, they might be like, Mom, Dad, I'm kind of scared and I don't know why. <sighs> Aliens, in my opinion, is the staple alien movie. The staple, almost like when people refer to, man, Metroid needs a movie. That's kind of when people are like, yeah, we could see Metroid kind of playing out like Alien because it's dark, you're alone, the main character is a female, you kind of don't know what's happening, you don't know what's going on, and you're kind of scared the whole time. And it's really cool to see that this movie was made in 1986 and it's held up so well. I have recently revisited it and watched the movie, loved it, enjoyed it just as much as I remember enjoying it, but also the visual effects being still really prominent in a way to where they stick out when you see it. You haven't been, you know, tainted by everything you've seen nowadays and go, oh, I've kind of seen all that. That's pretty cheesy. No, the effects are awesome. And in my opinion, I've stated before, uh, enhanced with the realisticness of the effects back in the day. I never thought there'd be a day where I have an excuse to talk about the movie, The Fly. That is a movie with Jeff Goldblum, a movie that stood out to me more than I would have thought. And I just kind of see it reoccur in different places in my life moving forward. And I'll explain that in a minute. But basically, if you haven't seen the movie, spoiler for all of these, Jeff Goldblum plays a character who is running some experiments. And needless to say, long story short, I don't want to completely ruin it because it's definitely well worth a watch. Jeff Goldblum does an experiment, goes inside of like a chamber, a fly happens to get in there with him, 
and basically Jeff comes out, everything seems normal, but through time, Jeff slowly becomes a fly. And the reason it stands out is because it's not like one of those movies, uh, what I was talking about. Hey look, an Urkel shirt, speaking of. But like back in the day watching Family Matters, you know, Steve Urkel would go into a transformation chamber, come out, hey, now he's Stefan Urkel, and everything's cool, and there was no crazy transformation, except the first time he did it, he had a little bit of jitters. But once he got a machine, he just, boom, Steve comes out, he's now Stefan. Jeff Goldblum did not come out like, Oh hey, everything's normal and I'm a, I'm a fly now, look at me. Bzzz. No, it was very gruesome, very grotesque, very slow, very hard to watch, watching Jeff look in the mirror and pull his teeth out and pull off fingernails and slowly seeing this transformation of also loved ones or a loved one, I don't wanna to spoil too much, seeing him go through this and the look of absolute grotesque terror on her face while she sees someone that she cares about turn into a fly in a horrific, disgusting manner. I absolutely recommend you check it out. And earlier I was referring to another part of it playing back in my life, and that was one of the Simpsons' Treehouse of Horrors when Bart basically became a fly. They did a huge throwback to that, and I didn't even realize that when I was a kid because I'd seen both at that point, and I was like, what? I feel like I recognize this from somewhere. As an adult, I'm like, oh, that's clearly the fly. Bart became a fly. <laughs> A movie that I have to point out that I wouldn't say it was necessarily one of my favorites, but I know it was huge when it came out in 1986, and that's Top Gun, and it's definitely held its place as being huge to this day. I feel like for me personally, again, not being too into the movie, I do know that this is the movie where when I saw it, I was definitely pumped up, I was definitely excited, and I loved the soundtrack for it. And I also think this is when Tom Cruise kind of stuck out to me. I think I had seen a Tom Cruise movie previously to this, but I don't think I really cared about him or who he was or anything. But I think after this movie, Tom Cruise, in my personal opinion, became the Tom Cruise that we all know and all think is, hey, Tom's a bad mother. I got him. This next movie really speaks to the power of nostalgia. When I was looking through a list of 1986 movies, this one I would say was the biggest standout for me, and that was An American Tale. And the reason I say so is there's a song in this movie to where when I hear it, even right before filming this video, I listen to the song one more time just to take another peek at it, and every time I hear it, I get teary-eyed. And I don't necessarily have any specific tie to it, not with my parents or my brother or my sister, or even with my kids singing it to them because they love this song as well. You know, somewhere out there beneath the pale moonlight. And yes, I cracked my voice on purpose there because that's how the song goes. But I just adore this song so much to where I don't have a specific reason for where I was when I was a kid listening to it. But I know as an adult that this song holds so much power in my heart. And I, again, can't pinpoint it. But American Tale, when I saw the name among 1986 movies, I was like, I have to pick this movie. And I don't even know why. I know I like it. But then when I heard the song and tears started coming out, I'm like, I, I still can't nail it, but there was something there. There's something there that's holding on to me. To start off for video games, we're kicking off with one of the most staple games in the retro world that people love that has stood the test of time, and that's Castlevania. Castlevania was a huge hit in my house with my brother Nathan especially. Again, anytime I'm going through these videos, you're going to hear a lot about my brothers. My brother Nathan was obsessed with this game. We loved the music. We loved the tones. We even loved just the opening scene of Simon Belmont going through the gate, the gates opening, or even just standing in front of that gate. It holds such power. My brother was a master at this game, a master at the bosses. I remember him playing the bosses thinking, how are you doing this? I remember him platforming with ease and perfection thinking, how was he so good at this? Again, I would say this is maybe a game that I didn't play as much, but I watched my brother Nathan play the heck out of Castlevania. And there has been many great Castlevania games since.
Akari Warriors is a game that many games play like. There's a lot of games that kind of clone this or that maybe even came out before this, but there's a lot of games that hold to this style. But for me and my household, Akari Warriors was the one that we played the most. It was actually a game that was rented and I would say more with my cousin Chris and it became just kind of a staple and I remember us playing other games of this genre, of this style, of this nature, thinking they're good, thinking they were great, but for some reason we always came back to Akari Warriors time and time again. And even when my cousin and I I have talked in the recent years and he's like, yeah, I know you're still in a Nintendo and video games. Do you still play Akari Warriors? That makes me happy when people say stuff like that because it shows, hey, that held a special place for you as well. I'd say runner up to Super Mario Bros, the second most important video game or video game franchise of all time. That's the legend of Zelda. This is perfection to the world. There is a lot of lists out there, funny enough, that have placed a Zelda game of any nature, whether it's Ocarina of Time, Breath of the Wild, Link to the Past, Original Zelda from 1986. There's so many lists that have a Zelda game as the number one rated best game of all time. And this all started right here in 1986 with The Legend of Zelda, a top-down explorative game with pretty basic music at the time, but such beautiful, pretty music that has become something that gamers all alike, when we hear any tune from a Zelda video game, it's like you just stop and go, oh, it's Zelda, and it's exciting, and it's fun, and you love it. It's hard to find people. It's hard to find people out there that don't enjoy a Zelda game, whether it's from the old school style, or from the new school games, or somewhere in the middle. Zelda is a beloved franchise by all, and it started here in 1986. Rolling Thunder on the arcade was a game that I played after I played a game called Codename Viper on the Nintendo Entertainment System, which is a game I loved as well. But I remember playing Rolling Thunder a few years after I played Codename Viper, and I thought to myself, man, this game is just like Codename Viper. It plays just like it. It was like I got some sort of expansion pack or some sort of DLC as a kid. And that's really what it felt like to me, and that's why it really sticks out to me. Because when I played it, I wanted more of Codename Viper after I beat it. I loved loved the game. And again, going to Rolling Thunder, I was like, wow, this is almost like I got a part two that I didn't know about. And I don't know what it is, but as a kid, when you got something like that, you know, DLC's expansion packs weren't a thing in the world. So to get that was almost like this huge mind blow as a kid, like, whoa, I just got an, an add-on. I just got more levels put on. So Rolling Thunder is always going to stick out to me because it definitely blew my mind as a kid. Like, hey, this is, this is, this, this, this is my part two. This next one I'll talk about quickly as I've talked about many times here before on the show, and that is Snail Maze for the Sega Master System. This game is not actually a cartridge-based video game. It is a game that was built into some Sega Master System consoles, and what you did, you get the Sega Master System, you turn it on with nothing inside, no card, no cartridge, and if you were lucky, you got snail maze. This is exactly what it sounds like, a cute little maze that you play as a snail with some repeating soundtrack. But for me, this stands out because if my memory serves me correctly, and I've talked about this before, this was the first video game I've ever played. I might be wrong, but as my memory, that's as far back as I can think of my first time ever playing a video game. Playing Metroid on the NES as a kid was a very bittersweet thing, at least for myself, because I was used to playing games where fast paced, go, 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 just pop it in and play the game and get moving and get to the end boss and do what you had to do. But when you played Metroid, it wasn't so simple. You had to explore, you had to look around, you had to platform back and forth, go to areas that you previously thought you didn't need to go to or, or duck or roll up into a little ball here and press this button here and maybe make a pathway through here. Metroid, I feel like for the NES is really one of the first games or maybe the first where you feel like you had to put in a lot of extra effort to get to areas you needed to go to. And whether you liked it or not, and I remember me personally as a kid, I didn't really like it until I was older and then I understood it more and I was like, I get it. There's, this is just not what my brain was used to doing. And Metroid again has obviously stood the test of time with some great games after it. Super Metroid, a game that everybody loves as well. But even to this day, as we're all eagerly awaiting, not so patiently anymore, Metroid Prime 4. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is a really unique one for me and the reason I picked it is because this song had me confused as a kid. And the reason I say that is my parents as a child would talk about Kenny Loggins around the house. And I, with my big brain, made the assumption that the name Kenny Loggins is must be associated with like a 95 year old guy who sits on the porch and sings old cowboy hymns. Needless to say, when I heard the song Danger Zone and my parents were like, yeah, that's Kenny Loggins, I was like, huh? Kenny Loggins, he wouldn't sing a song called Danger Zone, especially a song that sounds like that, especially a song that's gonna be related to such a cool movie like Top Gun. So for me as a kid, Kenny Loggins, it was a confusing time, but Danger Zone, what a great song. Going along with movie tie-ins, my next choice is Living in America by James Brown. This song was heavily used in the movie Rocky IV, which came out the year previous in 1985, and this was when Apollo Creed was coming out to fight Ivan Drago, which didn't turn out so well. I've always loved James Brown and his flamboyancy, his excitement, his eagerness, the way he moves, his mannerisms, when he performs and when he sings. I absolutely adore that. I love when people are ecstatic about anything in life. Also, I'm a huge, firm lover of America. I have to be honest. I have USA tattooed on my body. I have a Liberty Bell tattooed on my body. I have American flag tattooed on my body. I have the Statue of Liberty tattooed on my body. It's something I'm proud of, so I'm excited. So, living in America, Rocky IV, and James Brown, those are three things I really love, so great choice. I'm very glad to have this here in 1986. <laughs> Sledgehammer by Peter Gabriel is a song that I've heard more times than I can tell you. When I was in my early 20s, I worked at a produce shop as a produce man, and I was working the early shift. You know, I was working from 3 a.m. till about 1 p.m. And when I was in there, the store that I worked at, which was called Sprouts, they loved the oldies, and they played these songs on repeat. And I'm talking about their list of songs that they played on repeat wasn't like, oh, we're encompassing all of the 1980s, or all the 1960s, or all the 1970s. It was basically them saying, we're picking about 15 oldies and we're just playing them on repeat over and over and over. And Sledgehammer was on there by Peter Gabriel. And man, I heard that song a lot. Funny enough, I don't even think I really got tired of it till like maybe after six months of hearing it on repeat. But got to admit, now when it comes on the radio, I turn that baby up. Manic Monday by the Bangles is one of those songs, and I know it sounds cheesy, when people are like, hey, you ever hear a song, and it's one of those songs you just kind of have to snap with, or kind of groove with, or kind of sing with. I don't know why I'm doing that as I'm saying that, but it's just another Manic Monday. I wish it was Sunday. That song to me, every time I hear it, got a jam, got a groove, great song. Something I'm really proud of is that my parents growing up were very much in love, and they still are, and I always remember them dancing together to music. It was huge in our household. I'd wake up in the morning, they were dancing together. As a kid, I thought, oh my gosh, so cheesy, so lame. As an adult, as a married man for 13 years, I absolutely adore their relationship that they did that. I think it is one of the coolest things, the healthiest things they ever could have done uh, for my childhood to show me that my parents loved each other. But one of the songs that they would always jam to and they'd be dancing together to is Higher Love by Steve Winwood. If you've never heard it, it kind of goes, break me a higher love. Oh. That song definitely has some funky grooves, some funky jams, some funky beats, some funky choruses. And as a kid, again, hearing it, I was like, oh my gosh, it's kind of my parents, one of their songs they'll dance to, a little cheesy. But now as an adult, every time I hear this song, I can visualize them dancing together in the living room, goofing around, playing around, and I absolutely love it. It takes me to a very happy place. We've all heard the song Stand By Me by Ben E. King, which came out and was a hit in 1961, which is why I was a little confused when I was looking at the Billboard chart toppers for 1986. When I saw Stand By Me on there, I was like, oh, it's gonna be by someone who redid the song. And I looked back and I was like, wow, this is the song from 1961 by Ben E. King, but it then became a hit again in 1986. I don't exactly know all the reasons for that, but I have to say, what a fantastic song. It's one of those songs where if you're in a bad mood or kind of feeling down or a little low, you hear this song and you're gonna be in a good mood. Who doesn't know the song, Stand By Me as well? Go ahead, I, I challenge you to go to anywhere, any public area and tell somebody, hey, ever heard Stand By Me? See if they can't sing you the chorus.
That's all we got for 1986. Up next is 1987. Let me know what you liked best about 1986. Was it the music? Was it the movies? Or was it the video games? All right, you guys have a great day, and we'll talk to you next time. See ya.